For the latest in strategic affairs, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell icon for updates. This is Track News Global. I'm Amitabh Bravi. I'm extremely glad to introduce for the first time on our platform from Tehran is Ali Ahmadi. He's a geopolitical and geoeconomical geo-eco- analyst. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ahmadi, so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Sam, we just uh, wanted to quickly take you through uh, the region and how you uh, visualize uh, Iran's foreign policy, especially with uh, Afghanistan being the center of uh, the world's attention at the moment. Uh, Iran was probably the most critical of uh, the Taliban government in terms of uh, conditionalities or um, commitments that it had not met, especially when uh, what was happening in Panjshir. In your uh, view, what is Iran's foreign policy towards uh, the Taliban government, especially since uh, it has in the past supported at least factions of the Taliban and uh, harbored even Al-Qaeda? Well, uh, I, I, Iran, there's a lot of strategic ambivalence right now in Tehran about how to approach the Taliban. Uh, Iran is very uncomfortable with the Taliban. They've had contact with the Taliban uh, over the years, especially after they were essentially uh, booted out of there in terms of having any influence in Afghan affairs by the U.S. government from about 2004, 2005 on. Before that, before the U.S. invasion, Iran was the primary sponsor of the Northern Alliance, which was the group that was fighting the Taliban. Uh, and right now, many of those groups have tried to reorganize in the Panshi region, uh, northeast of Kabul, to try to take on the Taliban. But it's it's a much smaller faction than it was back then, uh, being led by the son of the former leader of the Northern Alliance, Ahmad Mas'ud. And Iran it has been essentially decided that it needs to try to get along with the Taliban to some extent. But there are a lot of different factions that seem to have a lot of different opinions. Uh, on this topic. I- Iran is very concerned about the Taliban because they are a Sunni hardline uh, organization. These kinds of organizations tend to have very hostile, even sometimes genocidal attitudes about Shia Muslims. And that was certainly true of much of the Taliban back in the 1990s, where they committed a lot of atrocity against the uh, Hezara population in central, Af- in central Afghanistan. So uh, Iran is happy that the U.S. is no longer there. But Iran doesn't really know, doesn't really seem to know what exactly to do with the Taliban. And it has very, seems to have very little influence with the, uh, with the organization, despite having had contacts with them for, for a number of years now. You mentioned the Hazaras, the Shia Hazaras, and uh, uh, there have been reports suggesting that uh, they have been targeted. Uh, Nobody really knows on the ground what's happening. In terms of that, how do you see Iran's uh, foreign policy? Um, evolving and if you could shed light on the Fatemiyun brigade as well well that, that's i mean that's a that's a good question and not something we've heard very much about the Fatemiyun division was a, a group largely made up of of uh, afghan refugees uh, residing in iran a lot of afghan refugees about 4 million afghan refugees it's between 2.5 million to 4 million Afghan refugees have been living in Iran over the course of the last 40 years. And so some of them uh, became part of this, the Fatemi Yun division that fought in Syria. Right now, that organization seems to have been demobilized. Uh, Iran is trying to maintain a, a fairly uh, a, a neutral relationship with the Taliban. They obviously have interests in Afghanistan, especially in the, in the uh, Western provinces of Afghanistan, like Harat, which are, you know, right on the Iranian border. And stability there is very important to Iran. Uh, If the Taliban uh, begin to go back on some of the policies they've promised to take on, one of that certainly being treating the Hezare with some uh, some measure of respect, then, uh, you know, the, the, the people saying that we have to figure out a way to get along with the Taliban, we don't have a choice, there's no Northern Alliance, that argument maybe doesn't become as... Uh, as potent as it as it currently is. The Taliban have been sending a lot of mixed messages about the Hezare. One day they're filming themselves saying that, you know, this is your country too, we'll respect you. The next day they're destroying a, a statue of a, of a Hezare, uh, of, a, of a deceased Hezare cleric. So it, it's not really clear. And right now they're doing a lot of sort of tactical PR to try to avoid uh, the powers in the region sort of trying to come after them in Afghanistan. Who knows what that's going to, how that's going to shake out when the dust settles and they feel a little bit more in control.
Sure. Uh, Iran was probably the, the first country which also uh, allowed oil and petroleum back uh, once the Taliban took over on the 15th of August. Explain the relationship in terms of uh, trade, because I think uh, uh, it is very high in uh, pre-Taliban times with Afghanistan and the issue of water. Mm -hmm. Well, th there's been a number of, uh, of, of, of complicated um, disagreements between Iran and Afghanistan about water, especially in the uh, in the the southwestern parts of Afghanistan and and eastern Iran, which is all both areas are very much parched for water. So it it is there's some disagreements there that have to be dealt with and haven't really been dealt with for uh, for some time. In terms of trade, uh, Iran had a fairly robust trade relationship with Afghanistan. Iran uh, went towards a policy that very much prioritized trade with its neighbors. Uh, due to the due to the the Western sanctions, it's harder to find, say, markets in Europe. So uh, Afghanistan doesn't exactly have a, 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 a very large economy, but that trade uh, is somewhat lucrative. It certainly did help Iran importing some U.S. dollars, um, not very much, but 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 a bit. And so who knows what's going to happen with regards to that. I imagine those trade relationships are going to continue. Most of those trade relationships involve a lot of people in Afghanistan who are either sort of historically uh, close to the Persian Empire, places like Harat and Mazar Sharif, and of course the Hezara in the middle of the country. So Iran is, is going to try to make, manage its relationship with, uh, with the Taliban and also its relationship with a lot of people in Afghanistan who don't agree with the Taliban and are sort of friendly to Iran uh, with, uh, by by making sure these trade ties exist. And of course, Iran is generally opposed to the idea of sanctions and sort of denying people oil and uh, oil and gas and things like that, obviously for, for very obvious yeah. reasons having to do with the last 20 years of US sanctions. Just picking up from that point, how do you see India and uh, Iran managing their relationship? Uh, if, of course, the, the JCPO or the return to the JCPO goes ahead and sanctions are taken back to what they were before, that relationship in terms of petroleum, which India has cut to zero because of US sanctions and other relations. How do you see that developing, even though there's a lot of flux? Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Rouhani administration that just left power, one of the things they were they were criticized for, and I think this is largely appropriate, is that they had very much focused on relations with the West and the JCPOA and to some extent neglected some of the Eastern relationships. Now, that may have been less the case with India than with others. President Rouhani did travel to India. Uh, there was, uh, it, it, it did seem uh, interest both on the part of Iran and, and uh, President Modi in terms of uh, improving the Iran on uh, India relationship that that didn't go anywhere because US sanctions came back and India is essentially not really willing to try to take on uh, US sanctions in the way that for example uh, China has so the most important uh, sort of uh, the relationship between Iran and India was about this particular port called Chabahar which is in uh, south Eastern Iran, and it's a very strategically important port because, it, especially for a country like India, because it could provide India with a lot of trade access, especially to places like Central Asia, and so that could be very important to India. And India was making, was planning on making some investments, even when the JCPOA was operating. Those investments seem to be fairly small and not necessarily materialize as much as they should. But after the JCPOA uh, was was uh, done away with by, or at least the U.S. participation uh, ceased, there was really no, um, no effort to to further that relationship. Uh, our trade relations are, are very low. Indian involvement in the Chabahar project is is essentially nothing right now. And right now, people are talking about possibly Chinese involvement in the Chabahar project. And that certainly seems easier, just simply from the perspective that if the sanction, if another Republican president is elected three and a half years from now, what's going to happen to any investments India makes to Chabahar? Is that going to sever those relations again, or are you going to have a country like China that is maybe more uh, more inclined to try to challenge U.S. sanctions? Sanctions, essentially because it's worried about being targeted by them. So pre, uh, say, August 15th and the Taliban takeover, at least uh, India and Iran would be making, you know, statements that Chabahar is, is progressing, even though it's slow, it's been over, what, uh, a decade now. But the fact that the Taliban is uh, not seen as particularly friendly to the Indian government and Chabahar was uh, seen as the alternate route you were talking about uh, to uh, Central Asia, and more importantly, to bypass uh, what Pakistan doesn't allow India, that is transit by land to Afghanistan, to Afghanistan, 
But if you have a Taliban government uh, that really doesn't, uh, uh, is not going to be friendly with India, presuming, uh, then is Jawar even more irrelevant apart from what the China angle that you were pointing out? Well, I, I mean, yeah, Chabahar becomes becomes very strategically important because of all the economic activity surrounding Afghanistan, not so much because of Afghanistan. And so the, the project is still is still very important. But, you know, the Central Asian countries, uh, it's not that they're not selling oil and natural gas now, but their opportunities would certainly uh, grow exponentially for for outbound sale of oil and natural gas if they were to build pipelines through uh, eastern Iran. But they've known this for a very long time, and they haven't done it for worry about being targeted by U.S. sanctions uh, over Iran. So it's it's I, I don't really know how this relationship is going to move forward. When the when the Trump administration pulled out of the JCPOA, President Trump apparently had a conversation uh, with with Narendra Modi and promised certain licenses so that Indian companies can participate in the Chabahar project. But essentially, the, they, that never really ended up happening. They never took advantage of those licenses because they were concerned about, you know, would we get another license in six months when this expires? It creates a lot of uncertainty around business. So I think India will definitely buy Iranian oil. Uh, that's something that uh, the JCPOA coming back into effect will, you know, will allow Iran to, to sell oil. But in terms of trade, in terms of there might be some hands off trade, some distant trade. But in terms of cooperation and investment, it's going to be very difficult considering the precedent that the United States has set. And so now and this is one of the things that's become a serious issue in the negotiations to get back into the JCPOA is what guarantees do Iran and its prospective business partners have? The U.S. is actually going to stay in this thing. And would any of that investment actually come uh, considering that the U.S. has set this precedent by leaving the JCPOA once? And it's almost certainly to do it again uh, as soon as another Republican president is in office in either three and a half years or seven and a half years from now. Uh, you referred a couple of times to China in relation to the Chabahar port. Uh, how do you see uh, uh, some analysts who look at uh, the change in the situation in Afghanistan as another opportunity for China to uh, step into the void in terms of uh, enlarging or extending its BRI from CPEC Pakistan into Afghanistan and uh, Iran? Uh, China would, as you pointed out, I think, on, in social media, very often, uh, like everybody else, look for stability. Right. I think China China needs uh, some uh, needs like I think most countries involved with the situation, with the possible exception of Pakistan, what China needs most in Afghanistan is for the tumult there not to spill over into Central Asia, where it has a lot of investments, into Iran, where it's planning on having a lot of investments. So what it needs is for is for that not to interfere with other things that are going on. I think Afghanistan can perhaps participate in uh, the BRI system, but not in terms of building massive you know, train links and, and so on. It, it soft BRI, as they call it, perhaps with hospitals, schools, some something like that to some extent. But I don't think Afghanistan is stable enough to to be a participate in BRI. I mean, Chinese investors, Chinese banks won't invest in BRI projects in Iran because they're worried about sanctions. So the idea that they're going to have the kind of risk tolerance involved with going into Afghanistan doesn't doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. One thing that especially a lot of Western analysts and as of as of uh, the last week, unfortunately, some Iranian newspapers have dabbled in is the idea of either China or Iran or both playing a significant role in Afghanistan, uh, not just to keep the, the spillover uh, in to keep the spillover from happening, but rather than trying to get access to Afghanistan's natural resources. Afghanistan actually has a trillion of dollars of natural resources and it has lithium which is very important for uh, uh essentially these batteries that are used in electric cars and things like that so it's highly coveted but it just seems like fool's gold frankly it's uh you know afghanistan is not going to be stable enough to facilitate industrial level mining operations anytime soon there are people with shovels and picks doing what they can, but it's, you know, you need in order to facilitate this kind of trade, industrial level mining operations that are particularly vulnerable to instability, just for very practical reasons. You're working on a mountain, you have a lot of heavy machinery. It just, it can't work where there's instability. And the vast majority of Afghanistan's lithium is actually in the northeastern part of the country, Nuristan, Panjshir, northeast of Kabul. And it's kind of hard to imagine how that area is ever going to be safe enough secure enough to facilitate any of these operations, even if anyone did have the stomach to try to deal with the Taliban government in order to do that. So the fulcrum for any possible geopolitical change seems to be the JCP JCPOA. 
the Americans, of course, and the West have other conditions. It's not just nuclear when you're talking about uh, uh, Iran's involvement in the region, uh, whether it's in Lebanon, with other, in Yemen. Uh, how? What is the, what is the best case scenario you see with the JCPOA? There's, of course, the governing council and then a meeting next week. But what's the best case scenario and the worst case scenario vis-a-vis -vis the JCPOA? Well, I mean, the the best case scenario is if we is if we go back into the JCPOA with Iran getting some assurances of America can just get everything it's got out of the 2015 deal, everything it got in 2015, it can have again. It wouldn't take very long. It wouldn't be very technically difficult for Iran to reverse all the actions it's taken in terms of in terms of um, in terms of going back into compliance. Now, Iran is accumulating knowledge with the research it's doing now, and that's something the U.S. has expressed a lot of concern about. And they've said that, well, if, you know, if, if this keeps going for another few months, the JCPOA won't be as worth it to us as it was in 2015. Essentially, arguing they might come not come into it, not come back into it at all if that happens. But that's obviously Iran's problem as well, because Iran was essentially promised a lot of things in terms of the sanctions actually being removed, meaning the pressure being removed, not just on paper, as the Supreme Leader has uh, stated and restated a number of times. And so Iran would be able to actually participate in the global economy. That didn't really happen when the JCPOA was being implemented under Barack Obama, and it's definitely definitely doesn't seem like it's going to happen now because of because of all the new anxiety created around it and the concern that another Republican president will just pull out of it again. So th this is Iran wants some guarantees, wants something. Uh, you know, there are some ideas out there about how the United States can, within its constitutional system, provide some guarantees. They seem to be fundamentally disinterested in that because that would get them a lot of heat from uh, both the Republicans in Congress and the hawkish Democrats who essentially lead Democratic uh, sort of lead the Democrats on foreign policy issues. And so they don't seem to want to go uh, towards that right now. And they have uh, indicated that they want Iran to make promises as to participating in a so-called follow-up agreement where Iran would make a variety of concessions on a number of regional issues, which Iran has already said it's not willing to make. So the, right now, that's, that's the impasse. The best case scenario is if we actually continue the JCPOA, that Iran does get some guarantees so that both sides are actually getting what they bargained for back in 2015. The worst case scenario is for this to go nowhere, and then we're essentially back on in a situation where the U.S. is trying to uh, assert pressure and Iran is resisting and essentially reciprocating that pressure through nuclear escalation. Um, you know, the United States has essentially fired every bullet in the sanctions gun, as their own former national security advisor under the Trump administration said. So it's kind of hard to know where they go from here. But going back into that environment of hostility and, and possibility of war, um, no one really wants that, obviously. So, I mean, in terms of uh, sanctions and the, the Iranian economy, how badly hit is it or how badly does the Iranian government need to get out of those sanctions to pull up the economy? And is there any change in policy in terms of uh, the new president and his team? Well, the, the new president and his team have been very clear that their foreign policy is going to be uh, less focused on the Europeans, less focused on, on the JCPOA, more focused on improving relations with regional countries. Iran has been making some progress with countries like Saudi Arabia. We've been making some progress with countries like yeah. the UAE uh, for uh, for about you know two years now. We used to be you know enemies. Maybe enemy is a bit harsh, but the relations were certainly hostile. But uh, they also want to improve relations with Eastern countries. Now that a lot of people essentially take as meaning China, because China is the one who's willing to buck the U.S. sanctions. But even the Chinese can only do that to a point. Private companies in China, even a lot of state-owned banks, are unwilling to to do business with Iran because they're worried about being targeted by by uh, U.S. sanctions, and that would essentially disrupt some of their global operations and perhaps make them undesirable or you know persona non grata in certain. Uh, Western markets, especially the United States, where they do a lot of business. So that's essentially the the, the new administration's strategy. But it's kind of hard to see how a lot of that can work without some sanctions relief. So there, the, the, right now, the Iranian economy is is doing fairly okay. The real has uh, deteriorated; it has gone down a bit more since Raisi was elected. Essentially, you know, market psychology, people being concerned that. That, that things are going to go nowhere with the JCPOA. Uh, Iran has been selling more oil uh, to China 
has been uh, essentially coming to a place where it has basic stability. The economy isn't necessarily doing well, but it's not necessarily concerned about the economy falling apart in some way. But, you know, for a lot of people, for a lot of people in the government, this is a concern. If you if you just sign on the dotted line, if you sign whatever, if you go back into the JCPOA without any guarantees, what's likely to happen the month later is that the Biden administration, even before a Republican administration comes into office, the Biden administration is probably going to try to re-implement a lot of those sanctions under non-nuclear rationalization. So they technically don't apply to the JCPOA and is a means of essentially trying to ratchet up pressure to get other concessions about regional issues or, or missiles. So it's a concern for you know the Raisi administration that's been in power for a very short, for just a few weeks, that if they agree to this and then and, you know, the sanctions are effectively, for the most part, still in place, except for some hands off trade and some arm's length trade and some oil sales that, you know, this this is not going to work out well for them because they're getting essentially a fraction of what the JCPOA initially promised back in 2015. President Raisi's first uh, overseas trip is ex expected to be the, uh, the SEO uh, summit where many of the other leaders are appearing virtually, India, including India's Prime Minister. How important is uh, what's been talked about full status uh, from observer status for Iran? Does it make a difference? I, I mean, it, it's hard to know what it means from a security and military standpoint. It would probably help coordination among countries uh, in the region in terms of security issues. It would certainly uh, symbolic uh, symbolic move. Iran does. It does seem that Iran is going to be allowed into the uh, in, in, is a full member into the SEO. They're going to start the process of membership. That process itself can take two years. But the thing is that historically, China has been concerned about being overly involved with Iran. Essentially, the, the concern is that they would be entrapped into Iran's other sort of other problems, either with countries like Saudi Arabia or with uh, the United States. And so Iran, China doesn't want to have a close partnership. This does seem to change that uh, does seem to change that impression a bit. The idea that uh, that I, I believe that, that was going to happen, I believe that because of American sanctions against uh, American um, sanctions against China, there have been some sanctions, but just a general level of hostility towards China. That China is going to be less concerned about angering the United States by violating its sanctions against Iran. But the idea that China is going to now accept Iran into a, a into a security. Uh, agreements into an a Asian security agreement, that's not something I would have said was likely a month ago. But it does seem to be happening. President Raisi is himself going to Tashkent for this meeting, and it seems unlikely that he would have done that unless he's given some promises from both Russia and China that their bid will be accepted this time around. So the, the and the country of Tajikistan, who was the one that uh, had an objection to it last time around, uh, has now said that they're not going to object to it this time around. But this organization, you know, it's not an Eastern NATO. There's no Article 5 component, mm -hmm. but it, it is still uh, symbolically important and possibly in terms of security coordination, practically important for Iran to be a full member of this organization. Mr. Ali Ahmadi, we'll continue this discussion because Iran is such a fascinating uh, place to look at in terms of both internal and external uh, Dynamics, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your analysis and perspective. Thank you for having me. And do send us uh, your feedback on uh, this program and any of the other programs that uh, you've watched on Strat News Global. If you're not subscribing to our YouTube channel, do that and follow our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You've been watching Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady.